available <laughs> to uh, to let you uh, take the floor and uh, uh, present your uh, lecture. There is a, it's it's only a small group of people to be honest. Uh, but if I see st still some people coming in. So my suggestion is start and we will listen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me share uh, my screen. Hopefully uh, you can see it now. Yes. Great. Uh, so uh, I have prepared a relatively short presentation in hope that uh, if uh, the subject is interesting, then uh, it would be uh, better to discuss uh, depending on the question. And essentially, uh, this talk uh, will be about the principle of uh, what we do. Essentially, uh, our field of expertise is attempting uh, to understand biological systems and the mathematical and computational modeling is uh, our main way of doing so. Of course, always in combination and with experiments. And uh, the uh, major aspect uh, of our approach is that we focus on mechanism uh, driving modeling, uh, meaning that our models are usually relatively simple uh, with regard to everything else. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, different types of complexity in biology and medicine, including mechanics, uh, uh, transport phenomena, uh, electricity, uh, a lot of things depending on the field. Uh, but what we uh, focus on is the faithful representation of uh, biology at the molecular level. Uh, what it means? If we uh, look at a typical biological network, for example, a network of metabolism, uh, we can see a huge amount of interconnected uh, reactions. Uh, metabolic network is uh, one type of uh, biological uh, network that uh, performs uh, some uh, kind of physiological function. Another network uh, very much familiar to us and a subject of our research is a signal transduction in blood platelets. Uh, we uh, work with other cell types as well, but uh, platelets, uh, because we uh, focus on hemostasis a lot, signal transduction in platelets is uh, one of our favorite uh, touches. Uh, it is uh, designed in a different manner compared with metabolic network. So uh, in the metabolic network, we have a sequence of enzyme converting the substrate uh, into different forms, while in signal transduction, a regulatory uh, network, we have a cascade. So uh, something uh, binds to a receptor, causing uh, activation of signal transduction cascades, uh, uh, meaning that in contrast to metabolic network, we do not have uh, a change of anything material. We have a uh, transfer of information uh, rather uh, than uh, some uh, material. And uh, this uh, uh, leads uh, to a number of physiological responses. Another uh, biological network, uh, which uh, has been a subject of our study for many years, is blood coagulation. And uh, here I show uh, one of the possible ways to represent it. Uh, here, uh, it, uh, you can more clearly see uh, the structure of this biological network. Uh, it is essentially a cascade. Uh, once again, enzymes activate uh, zymogens into active enzymes. No uh, movement uh, of anything material, just movement of information. 
and uh, we can see uh, that it is not a simple cascade. We have a number of positive feedback loops. Uh, now I'm uh, uh, gradually beginning to use terminology uh, of this uh, uh, field, uh, meaning that if something downstream uh, does anything to improve uh, its uh, formation, it is positive feedback loop. Or uh, in other cases, we have negative uh, feedback loops. Uh, when an enzyme activates something that uh, inhibits its production. Uh, we can see here that blood coagulation is a multi-step cascade with at least one, two, three, uh, four, uh, four uh, main positive feedback loops and at least one uh, negative uh, feedback loop. Uh, the complexity of blood coagulation often puzzles uh, people, even uh, those who work in hematology. And uh, to emphasize this, uh, I would point out that essentially, in contrast to metabolic networks where each step achieves something. Uh, here we have a single uh, reaction, uh, conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin that actually does uh, something useful, while all other uh, reactions are uh, just uh, regulatory, uh, meaning uh, uh, that they do not produce any physical change in the environment. They just uh, regulate. Uh, well, uh, we uh, working in the biomedical field know that regulators are important people. Uh, they uh, do uh, tell us what we can do, what we cannot do. Uh, it, uh, but here in coagulation, we see that it is mainly composed of regulators and uh, a single reaction uh, that uh, really does the job. Uh, there is a joke about a company uh, that uh, first hired a person to sweep uh, uh, the floor, uh, then they hired an account keeper to pay him his salary, then uh, they needed a human resources specialist to keep track uh, because they already had two employers. Uh, then uh, they had uh, to uh, hire a security, a director, a manager. In the end, uh, they didn't have uh, uh, enough money and decided uh, to optimize their personnel and uh, look who is the, the least important person here or oh, the one who sweeps the floor. Let us fire him. Uh, so blood coagulation uh, resembles a company from this joke uh, just before uh, firing uh, the person who really does uh, uh, something uh, practical, meaning fibrin. And uh, of course, uh, in order uh, to understand coagulation, uh, we need to understand the meaning behind each reaction. I uh, speak uh, about coagulation in more detail uh, simply because uh, uh, this uh, will be later used as an example of analysis of such a system. And of course, fibrinolysis, uh, which is also a cascade uh, that is a bit smaller than coagulation. Essentially, uh, it includes one reaction of plasminogen conversion into plasmin, uh, which then uh, performs uh, the actual action of degrading fibrin. And of course, uh, plasmin is involved uh, in many other important physiological processes. Uh, some of these uh, are uh, not uh, uh, very good for us in, in uh, for example, in the field of stroke, uh, uh, activation of uh, metalloproteinase uh, by uh, TPA and uh, plasmin uh, possibly is uh, the reason for bleeding uh, if uh, 
we uh, use EPA uh, too late uh, uh, during uh, the patient treatment. Uh, uh, still, uh, we do not actually understand the, this uh, cascade uh, very well. For example, it is quite unclear uh, why do we have uh, two types of activators for uh, this system. Well, uh, physiological uh, fibrinolysis is actually very fully understood uh, uh, because uh, the experimental uh, uh, intravital models uh, to observe it uh, are uh, almost non-existent. Uh, so this was uh, uh, the uh, brief introduction uh, of the examples and uh, what uh, do we mean by uh, biological networks? Uh, how can we deal with them? Uh, the main points are the following. Uh, the uh, biological networks could be incredibly complicated, but uh, their basic unit is uh, finally an enzymatic reaction. Of course, we have several other reaction types. For example, we can have action of inhibitors, which is simple bimolecular reaction, uh, but uh, the core is always the enzymatic reaction. Uh, and uh, from the mathematical point of view, uh, we have uh, the law of Michaelis Menten kinetics uh, and uh, the law of mass action for all other cases to uh, describe uh, this quantitatively. Uh, the two uh, fundamental types of biological networks are metabolic networks, uh, which uh, are sequences of transformation. And uh, another type is a regulatory system uh, that are arranged as cascades. Uh, it could be signaling cascade, uh, the complement network, uh, which is always also cascade, the trypsin tri uh, cascade in uh, our bowels, but essentially it is uh, the same principle. Uh, this uh, system uh, can have additional complications. They can be spatially heterogeneous or uh, they can uh, be uh, separated into different compartments. This system could be stationary or time dependent, uh, and uh, they can be quite large. Uh, the goal uh, of uh, what uh, we uh, do, and a lot of other pe people in the systems biology and system physiology field uh, uh, do, is the analysis of this uh, network. And uh, uh, you can easily imagine that the human brain is not sufficient by itself uh, to analyze uh, a cascade with numerous feedback loops, uh, nonlinear uh, enzyme kinetics, uh, and mathematical and computational models are uh, the main tool uh, that helps us uh, to do it. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we can uh, generally uh, understand uh, what uh, are the functions of uh, 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 this or that uh, component uh, in the uh, biological network. Uh, we can identify the critical uh, uh, rate limiting components that are responsible for specific functions of this uh, network. Uh, and uh, these uh, components can become targets uh, for new therapies uh, that would make a network to behave in a manner uh, that uh, is desirable. And uh, we can use uh, the understanding of the network uh, to correctly design uh, new uh, uh, medicines, uh, di diagnostic methods, we can do it in biotechnology and bioengineering uh, to optimize the uh, uh, design of metabolic pathways and so on. Uh, and uh, there is a very important point in the field. Uh, actually, uh, a lot of uh, biological people uh, do not like uh, theoretical biology. And they are right, uh, because uh, there are a lot of, uh, 
how can we say, uh, very poorly designed mathematical models in the field. Uh, if uh, we consider any specific biological field, we can uh, usually see a lot uh, of models of very poor quality that actually do not predict anything and uh, do not agree uh, with experimental data and are designed just for the sake of modeling. Uh, my mentor, uh, who uh, was my PhD advisor, used to say that that is why some theoretical biologists uh, uh, decide, decided to call themselves system biologists, uh, to just uh, uh, make a dividing line uh, from the poor uh, reputation of theoretical biologists. Okay. <laughs> uh, the message is uh, that uh, uh, there is a way uh, to make uh, the models uh, uh, of complicated system to be detailed and uh, at the same time uh, useful. This doesn't mean uh, that we always need uh, detailed mechanism driven models. At the different stages of uh, the analysis of a biological system, uh, we uh, use uh, models of uh, different degrees of complexity. And uh, those of you uh, uh, who pay attention to the different models, even the ones used in INSIS projects, uh, uh, know uh, that we have uh, detailed models for some problems and simplified uh, models for other problems. Uh, for example, uh, when we consider something that we do not know very well, there is no point in uh, developing a detailed model. On the other hand, when we consider something that we understand very well, we can sometimes uh, uh, simplify a model uh, so that we have a simple model with just the principal features uh, retained. And these are just two examples when we do not uh, need the uh, mechanism uh, driven models. On the other hand, uh, there are uh, cases when we do need them. For example, when we consider specific pharmacological problems, we uh, usually need uh, mechanism uh, driven detailed models because uh, uh, in order to uh, design uh, uh, new molecules uh, to select targets, we need a model that will include all uh, possibilities that are interesting, uh, interesting uh, to us. And uh, the uh, basic approaches to building a correct model is the use of modules, uh, uh, meaning that biological systems are modular at all levels of organization. And we can uh, use this uh, to uh, simplify uh, the building of the model. Uh, the critical uh, point is bottom-up uh, validation. So when we build a complex model, we validate each uh, uh, part of it uh, and only then put it together. And of course, the ability to provide useful predictions, which is a general uh, important thing for all types of models. Uh, here, uh, I included a brief list uh, of several practical projects. Uh, actually, most of uh, what we do is uh, how to put it, uh, just uh, basic research. Uh, we attempt first to understand biological systems and only then uh, do something useful. Uh, however, over the years, uh, we had a very nice uh, experiment, experience of collaborating with pharmacological and biotech companies uh, in the uh, using our models for uh, some uh, useful things. Uh, my first experiment, experience about 10 years ago was a uh, collaboration with Archemix uh, Corporation uh, in uh, Boston, uh, US. Uh, and then uh, it went on uh, because this molecule was purchased by Baxter. So uh, then we worked with Baxter. 
uh, is the analysis of a new uh, uh, molecule to improve coagulation in hemophilia as a, a bypassing agent. Uh, uh, another uh, study uh, that was not supported by pharmacological companies, uh, but uh, rather by uh, research grants, is uh, the uh, personalized uh, models of platelet signal transduction uh, that analyzed uh, uh, the mechanism of platelet activation by thrombin, depending of uh, the different uh, receptor sub subtypes. Uh, another study that uh, was not published uh, uh, because uh, it was uh, supported by uh, Samsung uh, uh, just uh, for practical purposes, it developed or being uh, personalized mechanism driven models of glucose metabolism. Uh, so uh, that uh, the programmers could, uh, based on this model, develop personalized insulin dosing recommendation uh, uh, based on the tests uh, obtained in uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices. Another study uh, that uh, was unfortunately uh, discontinued is a study supported by an Israel-based pharmacological company uh, to uh, design a prohemostatic enzyme uh, with several uh, domains uh, able to specifically uh, improve hemostasis. But still, uh, uh, it is not something uh, we can uh, talk about. Uh, and. Uh, a couple of recent examples is uh, uh, an attempt to understand the, the mechanism of bleeding uh, in Viscotaldrich syndrome. Uh, this is a complicated disorder uh, uh, which is associated with microthrombocytopenia, and we use the models of platelet calcium homeostasis uh, to uh, first understand and then experimentally confirm uh, the mechanisms uh, of uh, platelet uh, death in this disorder. And uh, our recent study uh, on uh, thrombolysis uh, uh, within uh, uh, the context of this project uh, that uh, all of you uh, probably uh, remember. Uh, I will uh, now uh, give a very uh, simple example of uh, what we can do uh, using the model. And I will use uh, the uh, blood coagulation, which is a relatively uh, well investigated uh, system to illustrate how this functions. So uh, we have a huge, terrible cascade. Uh, we uh, also know that this uh, cascade uh, essentially physiologically activates uh, functions in space in time, meaning that we have a surface with tissue factor and uh, uh, we have blood coagulation initiated by tissue factor that propagates uh, in order to form a solid clot. So we even had an experimental in vitro model uh, where we put tissue factor uh, expressing cells or surface in contact with plasma and observe a propagation of fibrin clot in uh, space from this uh, tissue factor bearing surface. Uh, we used computer modeling uh, to understand uh, which uh, reactions uh, uh, contribute uh, to uh, the uh, process of uh, clotting propagation. Uh, here uh, you can see uh, profiles of uh, factor 10A. Uh, let me go back to show. Factor 10A is a critical uh, enzyme in blood coagulation, uh, which uh, is just uh, one step uh, above uh, thrombin. Factor 10A uh, controls thrombin and thrombin controls fibrin. So essentially, factor 10A is ultimately responsible for uh, uh, to determine uh, where clotting occurs. Uh, 
And we can see uh, that factor 10A is produced by two enzymes, by factor 7A with tissue factor and by factor 9A in complex with uh, factor 8. Uh, this uh, seems very strange. Why do we have two reactions to activate factor 10? Uh, essentially, they do uh, the same uh, thing. Uh, we can uh, speculate that it is just for uh, make system uh, more reliable, but uh, it is not like that because without factor 9A, we have uh, a severe bleeding disorder of hemophilia B. And uh, without uh, factor 7A, we also have uh, severe bleeding. And uh, uh, without tissue factor, it is not possible to survive at all. Uh, so uh, these uh, two reactions clearly have uh, different functions. And uh, it is not clear why uh, we need two of them. Uh, if we... Uh, build uh, a plot of factor 10 concentration as a function of uh, space for different time points uh, in the uh, model uh, above. So we have tissue factor on the left and clot uh, goes uh, to the right. Uh, we can uh, analyze using the model how much factor 10A is produced uh, by intrinsic pathway uh, with factor 9 and uh, how much is produced by extrinsic pathway by factor 7A. And we can see uh, that uh, in the beginning almost everything is produced by extrinsic pathway. However, uh, with uh, this uh, factor 10A cannot get far from the activator. Uh, it is. It remains uh, near uh, the tissue factor bearing surface, while the majority of uh, factor 10A far from the activator is produced by intrinsic uh, kinase. And uh, uh, the explanation is that factor 10A and factor 9A have uh, different functions. Factor 9A uh, is not uh, inhibited uh, by plasma inhibitors. It can, uh, it has a, a half lifetime of uh, hours in blood, so it can freely circulate far from the activator and produce factor 9, 10A far from the activator. While factor 10A is important for the local. Uh, triggering uh, coagulation response. And uh, if we analyze roles of different parts of the coagulation cascade, uh, we can ascribe uh, specific functions to uh, specific parts. For example, uh, we were able to show uh, that this positive feedback factor five activation by thrombin and uh, then additional production of thrombin is uh, the module uh, responsible for threshold activation of blood coagulation, meaning that at very low tissue factor concentration, blood coagulation is not activated at all, while at the higher concentration, uh, it is the explosive response. And this uh, triggering uh, is uh, explained by this positive feedback, while longer range positive feedbacks are uh, responsible for the uh, spatial propagation. And uh, actually, uh, that's it. Uh, I uh, decided not to uh, include the uh, additional uh, slides. Uh, uh, this is uh, the general idea of the approach that we use uh, to uh, understand biological systems and uh, to apply uh, this understanding for uh, something useful. I intentionally did not uh, speak about our uh, work uh, on thrombolysis because it is already published uh, and uh, it would be in a way a repetition of uh, what we 
uh, talked about uh, during the meetings. Uh, but uh, I will be happy uh, to add something on thrombolysis or any other uh, subject uh, that uh, I have raised or I have not raised uh, during this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So maybe, Mikhail, I have a question about uh, how to simplify this type of system, which uh, can be extremely difficult when you clearly make the point. And so what's your strategy, I mean, to determine what is really important and what is not that important? I, I, do you have a methodology that can be used like uh, regularly for that? Yes. Uh, essentially, uh, the methodology consists of uh, two uh, approaches. The first uh, stage is sensitivity analysis. Uh, because uh, in a large system, uh, there are a lot of parts that uh, could be not involved in the response, uh, which is interesting to us. Uh, so uh, first we perform uh, different types of sensitivity analysis. And uh, based on uh, this analysis, uh, we uh, can completely remove uh, some parts of the system. After that, uh, we uh, analyze uh, uh, temporal uh, dynamics. Uh, in other words, uh, we analyze uh, typical characteristic time scales of the variables in the system. Uh, to put it, uh, so uh, technically uh, this uh, uh, is implemented as a uh, slow fast analysis, uh, analysis of slow fast dynamics uh, uh, using Tikhonov's uh, the theorem and other uh, supplementary approaches. Uh, but uh, from the uh, practical point of view, uh, this approach is very simple. Uh, Dif uh, in a complicated system, uh, different processes occur at different time scales. And uh, we often are interested in a single time scale. For example, uh, in blood coagulation, in the vast majority of cases, uh, uh, the uh, main coagulation factors uh, cannot be uh, exhausted uh, during the coagulation process because they are in excess. And in viva, uh, additional coagulation factors are uh, brought uh, by uh, flow. Uh, so we can assume uh, that uh, some of the variables like factor 10 concentration are slow uh, for most of our uh, studies and we can make uh, these variables constant. On the other hand, uh, we have a lot of processes uh, that are uh, quasi-stationary, uh, meaning that uh, they are too rapid and uh, at our uh, physiologically relevant uh, time scale, we can assume that they uh, reach equilibrium. For example, uh, uh, if we uh, consider blood coagulation, uh, we have the assembly of membrane dependent complexes, which are reversible and uh, relatively rapid. And uh, in most models of blood coagulation, uh, we can assume uh, that uh, uh, at the time scale of actual coagulation, uh, uh, the enzymatic complexes are in at equilibrium. So we do not need uh, differential equation and we can use the uh, algebraic equations instead. Uh, well, of course, to perform, uh, to carry out this correctly, uh, we need to, to make a transition to dimensionless variables uh, and uh, to formally analyze uh, uh, time scales uh, of different differential equations. Uh, also, uh, this is a methodology, it is uh, still uh, flexible. So it is uh, more uh, 
light and art uh, rather than science uh, because uh, every uh, in every system uh, you still need a lot of physical and physiological intuition uh, to do this properly and uh, uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, difficult uh, to do. For example, uh, for blood coagulation, we were able to greatly simplify it uh, when we analyzed the problem of threshold because uh, it was relatively uh, short time scale. It is uh, decide, just decision to clot or not to clot. Uh, and we were able uh, to simplify uh, this huge network into a single uh, differential equation. Uh, uh, that was uh, in very good agreement with the original complicated model. But the area of applicability of this equation was just initial stages of blood coagulation. And uh, we still, uh, right now, we do not have uh, a model uh, that is simply than like 10 equation uh, for the whole blood coagulation uh, network under uh, uh, a variety of conditions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see a question from uh, Gabor. Yes, thank you. So uh, thanks, Mikhail, for the presentation. It was super interesting. I have a question regarding probably one of your last slides where you show the modular view of blood coagulation. And while you already partially answered this uh, as, um, as part of, of Bastian's question, but I was thinking that this whole system, of course, is a tightly coupled system, which is part of where the complexity comes from. So when you're applying this, uh, otherwise I think clear and beautiful view of, of different modules, how do you interface these modules? How do you apply it to, to a computational system? How do you make them talk to each other? And what's the information that is exchanged between these modules? So can you separate this somehow, or you still have to regard it as, as one complex system? Uh, so uh, when uh, we uh, use uh, modeling uh, to analyze this, uh, we uh, usually uh, begin uh, from a detailed model of a complex system. Uh, we do not assume existence of modules uh, from the beginning. Uh, but uh, when uh, we uh, build uh, the model, and we do it uh, uh, with all respect to biochemistry, uh, meaning that we uh, put there all reactions that we know about, and uh, uh, then we validate the model, and then uh, we begin uh, the backward uh, process of simplifying it. Uh, so uh, essentially, it looks like that. Uh, uh, we know uh, that the blood coagulation has a threshold. We can measure it experimentally. Uh, we uh, can uh, reproduce it in the model. And then uh, we uh, begin uh, to remove part of the system and see what we get. So, uh, and we can see, for example, if we take uh, blood from hemophilia patients, or if in the model we uh, remove any parts uh, from this uh, part of coagulation system, uh, all uh, threshold properties of uh, blood are retained. So we still have a threshold, and it is not greatly different from that of a blood of a healthy person. Uh, meaning that uh, these parts are not essential for the threshold. And we uh, do uh, the same uh, for all uh, parts. Uh, so uh, we go through the differential equation and just remove terms uh, or uh, uh, modify terms, or if we like, we can add terms of non-existent reactions to understand how uh, such a reaction would have changed the system. And uh, so uh, we uh, obtain a map. For example, uh, we know uh, that if we study propagation of clotting in space, uh, removal of factor eight uh, severely affects it. 
so we map factor eight to the module and so on. As a result, uh, 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 what we have here is uh, not a representation of the model. It is a representation of our understanding. Uh, we still have all uh, reactions uh, as they are represented in this uh, figure. Uh, actually, in, in the model, it is a bit more complicated because the figure is simplified. But uh, essentially, uh, every uh, enzyme interacts with all other enzymes uh, as we know it. Uh, but uh, based on our analysis, uh, we uh, make conclusion that the function of this enzyme, and uh, actually uh, we need more than one enzyme for a, uh, to achieve some goal. And this is how we get modules. Uh, the function of this module uh, is uh, to do this or that. I see. So, I see. And thanks. I, I think that's uh, that's starting to become clear to me. And um, what happens if one module depends on another one? I'm thinking, for example, the clot regulation or or the spatial propagation module depends on the flow module. Uh, it is indeed a problem. Uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, at least for other uh, metabolic networks or signaling networks, it is possible to clearly segregate modules. Mm -hmm. uh, in blood coagulation, it is uh, probably less clear. Uh, for example, we have thrombin, and without thrombin, we do not have coagulation at all. Uh, so uh, we can say that thrombin belongs to all of these modules. Uh, and uh, so we do have points of intersection that are probably uh, more significant than shown here. Uh, however, uh, we, uh, despite the, the crosstalk, uh, these modules are uh, sufficiently isolated. Uh, and uh, why it is there, uh, the biological system uh, do not need to be arranged in such a way, but they are. And this is an extremely exciting uh, uh, and fundamental problem. Uh, why uh, biological systems tend uh, to be modular? Uh, obviously not for, uh, to, they, uh, the goal is not uh, to simplify the life of systems biologists. Uh, uh, there should be uh, something uh, more practical. And uh, uh, right now it is not clear. Uh, there are very interesting papers uh, in other fields that specifically analyze the degree of modularity of a biological network and show that, for example, uh, bacteria uh, who live uh, in constant conditions uh, have uh, less modular networks than bacteria who live in uh, rapidly changing conditions. Uh, which suggests that probably it is good to, uh, the modules uh, are a way uh, to adapt. Uh, when uh, a system evolves, uh, it uh, should be modular because otherwise uh, change in one enzyme will affect uh, everything, which is uh, probably not a good idea for evolution. Uh, the same principle we have in uh, real engineering. Uh, uh, it is good to have, for example, in a car, uh, to have engine, uh, to have uh, brake system clearly uh, separated from each other. So uh, we have, do have a lot of overlapping, but uh, we uh, have uh, indeed uh, parts of the system that do not affect the uh, functioning of others. So, for example, the uh, thrombomodulin uh, protein C system, uh, which is a break of blood coagulation, has absolutely no effect on uh, uh, the triggering or spatial propagation. And uh, likewise, the positive feedback of factor seven activation by factor 10 
uh, absolutely have no effect on coagulation in the absence of flow. Clear. Thank you, Mikhail. Mikhail, I had, I had a very uh, specific question and a very general question. Uh, the specific question that I have actually is that I don't much about this cascade. I always forget the details, but I seem to remember that factor 10 and 5, they both bind to heparins uh, in order to find each other. And that's exactly where the, the, the direct uh, blockers of factor 10 work. Is, is this something that you take uh, account of? Uh, this, this, let's say, very localized spatial domain in your modeling? Or are you considering the local factor 5 and factor 10 uh, factors to be just freely moving? How do, how do you do this in this model? Uh, in the uh, basic model, uh, uh, we uh, consider binding of factor 10 and factor 5 to phospholipid surfaces to form prothrombinase. Uh, but uh, the uh, original models for this study uh, were designed for uh, the systems without heparin. And uh, this was added only later. Uh, because in blood we do not have heparin, uh, we can have it on vessel walls uh, or uh, in the patient. So uh, when we made the transition uh, to attempting uh, to understand what happens in patients, we did the uh, simplified versions of heparin action. So, so could you simulate the effects of uh, direct uh, factor 10 inhibitors uh, using this? Uh, yes, uh, of course. And uh, we uh, do it uh, a lot uh, because uh, uh, right now uh, one of the things uh, that uh, this uh, uh, gave rise to is developing of uh, some uh, uh, medical devices uh, for in vitro coagulation diagnostics. And uh, uh, we uh, use this model to simulate uh, what we observe in these devices in patients and, of course, in plastic from the generation as well. All right, thanks. Um, my, my very general question actually is uh, Alphonse keeps telling us that we have to do VVUQ verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. Uh, so maybe uh, I could ask, how do you do this? Uh, how much is not known uh, on all the, let's say, the rate constants and so on, and how do you deal with this? Uh, uh, essentially, it looks like this. Uh, we uh, begin uh, from the approximate uh, design of a system. Uh, that is uh, uh, more or less textbook. Uh, and then, uh, in order to build uh, the model, we uh, take each reaction and uh, go uh, down to the uh, original data, meaning uh, to the studies uh, that discovered uh, this reaction and uh, determined its rate. After that, uh, uh, we uh, use uh, this information to build a more uh, realistic uh, uh, scheme of uh, the system. And uh, we begin uh, to build a model uh, step by step. Uh, uh, we take a part of the system and uh, uh, try to analyze uh, what uh, the people know about this part. And uh, then we put this together to uh, simulate experiments uh, uh, that are aimed at the understanding of this part. Uh, for example, uh, when uh, we consider the initial steps of blood coagulation, uh, we have several first reactions where tissue factor binds factor 7A and then activates factor 10. This is uh, a very small part of coagulation, but we already have several steps here, and we have also inactivation of uh, uh, extrinsic kinase by tissue factor pathway inhibitor. And uh, if we put uh, together uh, what we know uh, about it uh, and compare it with the experiments where people put together tissue factor 7A and factor 10, 
uh, we can uh, validate this part of the system. So if we are lucky, uh, we uh, observe uh, the same uh, results uh, we have in experiments. Uh, if we are not, uh, we understand that we are missing something. Actually, this was my uh, master's project. Uh, originally, 20 years ago, uh, I was asked uh, to design a model of blood coagulation. Actually, at that time, uh, they told me simply improve the existing model of blood coagulation uh, by adding extrinsic pathway. I added these reactions, and these reactions just didn't function. Uh, uh, putting together uh, the data uh, was not able to describe experiments where people put these enzymes together. So my first paper in European Journal of Biochemistry was about uh, attempting to resolve this. And then we reproduced uh, this step-by-step uh, step, uh, for other reactions. Uh, so, uh, for, once again, for me, blood coagulation was uh, the subject uh, of uh, my PhD research as well. So, my second paper was about uh, resolving problems of intrinsic kinase. And at that time, I had to do uh, my own experiments uh, to understand how the model of extrinsic kinase functions. And that was my third paper. Uh, in the biochemical journal, and so on. Uh, until we are able to put all of this together, uh, and at some stage we make a transition from a system where we put several enzymes together to a system uh, where uh, we have everything but just missing some enzyme. For example, uh, we have people with hemophilia C, without factor 11. And we can use experiments with their blood to validate all the rest, and then at factor 11. We can uh, consider people with hemophilia A without uh, all of this uh, pathway. We can uh, have people with protein C deficiency. And uh, using this, uh, we uh, build a model step by step. Uh, depending on the system that we analyze, uh, the degree of uncertainty greatly varies. My favorite example, uh, blood coagulation is relatively well known. So we have estimation for almost all rate constants. However, for the membrane dependent reactions are a terrible headache. Uh, so we sometimes very fully understand the mechanisms and uh, uh, these are the parts of the model that are not very much reliable uh, even now. Uh, my favorite example of uncertainty is activation of uh, factor 11 by uh, thrombin. Uh, this uh, long-range uh, positive feedback uh, was discovered uh, by uh, David Gailani and George Bros in uh, 1991. Uh, they published a paper and in science that uh, they have discovered this uh, great reaction. Uh, a year later, other people have published that this reaction doesn't exist uh, in vivo. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, yet other group has published uh, that uh, no, under such and such conditions, this reaction does exist. And uh, as of uh, now, uh, the range of uncertainty for this reaction is uh, about four orders of magnitude. Uh, if we uh, do not take into account uh, the laboratories that claim that this reaction doesn't exist. Uh, However, for our purposes, uh, I am quite confident that we have a good rate constant for this reaction uh, because our model uh, can clearly uh, describe differences uh, uh, between uh, hemophilia C and healthy uh, blood. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other remarks? 
if not Mikael, I would very much like to thank you. And I'm again uh, acting like the chair, but we would like to thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the great question and the discussion. And uh, I, if anyone of you has an interesting biological network to model or an interesting biomedical problem uh, that uh, requires uh, involvement of any biological network, uh, please feel free uh, to call us. Uh, uh, for us, it is uh, actually our main occupation. Uh, so my own research is mostly uh, uh, around the hemostasis and thrombosis, but uh, uh, other people uh, in our team uh, consider uh, metabolism of almost everything, uh, signaling on almost everything, and uh, uh, some processes at the tissue uh, level as well. So we are always very much interested in practical problems. Yeah, thanks. Okay then, bye-bye to everybody. Thank you.